Ladies and gentlemen, the subject before us tonight, Christianity and science. Are they friends or are they foes? I'd like to speak to you about those two issues if I can. Have you ever heard the following questions? The first one, I think, that comes over, if not as a quotation verbatim, it comes over as a message on the media, on the airwaves, in the newspapers. Well, scientists don't believe in God. Sometimes it's scientists don't believe in God anymore. Have you ever heard that one? What about this one? Science has all the answers to man's questions. Any question you can have, science is going to have the answer for it. Have you heard that point of view expressed? How about this one? Science is based on evidence. But Christianity, well, that's only based on faith. And we can't be sure about faith, can we? You ever heard that one? Well, those are the three questions that we're going to be dealing with tonight. And the first point I'd like to make is this one. If you look in the past, you find not just a few, but very many great scientists have been Christians. He's one of my heroes, said to be the greatest uh, experimental physicist of the Victorian era, the great Michael Faraday. Faraday was a Christian. He was a Bible-believing Christian. He was a member of a local church. His work through the week was working in the Royal Institution. Um, and of course, when Sir Humphrey Davy was asked, what is the greatest discovery you've ever made? Davy replied, Michael Faraday. He's the greatest discovery I've ever made. And of course, how about this chap? A few years ago, there was a survey in Physics World for the top 10 equations. Now, some people like to look at films. Some people like to listen to music and vote the top 10. But physicists like to think about equations. And they voted the most famous equations of history. Um, and of course, Maxwell's four equations, which describe electromagnetic phenomena, were voted as the top 10 in physics world some years ago. Uh, Fleming. Does anyone remember at school doing Fleming's right-hand rule or Fleming's left-hand rule? Well, we used to do that many years ago. And, of course, uh, uh, the man who is Fleming behind it, the first professor of electrical engineering in this country at University College London at the turn of the last century is Ambrose Fleming. Fleming invented the diode. And, of course, the diode is the... Uh, the invention of the diode was absolutely necessary for the era of radio to begin. And so you can say in, in some ways that Fleming was right at the start of the electronic revolution that powered through the last century and is taking us into this one. Fleming, as well as Maxwell, as well as Faraday, were all great scientists, all great Christians, Bible-believing Christians. And, of course, Morse. You heard of Morse code? Do you know the first message that was ever uh, put out over the um, telegraph was a quotation from the Bible, what hath God wrought? Now, why do I put those four names? There's many others. But, of course, uh, the, the first three are the founding fathers of my particular discipline, uh, electrical engineering and electronics. You can say, without fear of contradiction, that some of the greatest names, the greatest names, of electrical engineering and electronics are Faraday and Maxwell and, of course, Fleming. And we haven't mentioned Joule, James Joule, and we haven't mentioned Kelvin, Lord Kelvin. So it's fair to say that very many great scientists of the past were also Christians. So you might say, well, what about the present? Has it changed? I'm going to put the names up here of uh, professors in the UK, all of them alive at the moment in our universities, Professor Edgar Andrews from London University, Professor uh, Stuart Burgess from Bristol University, John Lennox from Oxford University, Professor Andy McIntosh from Leeds University, Professor Norman Nevin, now retired from Queen's University, Belfast. All of them Bible-believing Christians and have no problem pursuing an active and successful career in science and, and also being Christians. So it's fair to say that there are great scientists of the present day who are also Christians. And yet you wouldn't easily get that, that, uh, that message, you wouldn't easily get that, um, that viewpoint coming over in our media. But further, 
Um, there's a photograph of uh, Oxford, University of Oxford, the, uh, the ivory towers and the um, spires there of Oxford University, one of our most famous universities. And a walk around Oxford or Cambridge, you'll see that there's very many of the colleges that are named uh, with a Christian connection. There's Jesus College, there's Corpus Christi, there's Christ College. Science, in our country at least, but throughout the Western world in general, grew out of a Christian worldview. If you look at the founders of the Royal Institution, Royal Society rather, uh, very many of these men were Bible-believing Christians. What about the science having the answer to all of our questions? Well, actually, um, it's fair to say as well that science is limited in what it can do. It doesn't ask all the questions, so therefore it can't give all the answers. Science normally asks the questions how and what, but not often the question why. Let me give you an example. So you walk into the home one night, you go home and on the table is a beautiful cake. Now science can tell you what is in the cake. It can tell you how the ingredients came together in order to make that beautiful taste but it can't tell you why mum made the cake. Was it for the birthday? Was it for the anniversary? Or was it for some other uh, important date that you can't remember at that particular time? You don't know, because that's not a scientific question. So how do you find out why mum made the cake? The only way you can find the answer is for mum herself to say, well, I made the cake for dad's birthday or for our anniversary or for wherever it is. Now science is similarly limited in that it doesn't give always the reasons why things happen. Science is always changing. Um, there's no certainties in science. It, it really is all changing. A hundred years ago, nobody had heard of the Big Bang. Then in 1928, Georges Lemaitre, um, uh, a Jesuit priest from Belgium, came up with the idea that the universe had a beginning with a Big Bang. And of course he was hotly resisted because it sounded too much like a creation event for some people. But now of course Big Bang cosmology is, uh, is flavour of the month. And uh, very many scientists, that's the prevailing paradigm uh, in cosmology. And of course it will change in 50 years from now. And of course the third thing to say is that the scientific method is based on repeatable experiments. We've all been there in the chemistry lab and the teacher stands forward and he pours the hydrochloric acid on the iron filings and there's clouds of smoke and he tells us what it all means. He does it the next year and he does it the next year and of course uh, generations of school students are instructed. It's the repeatability of science of course that gives it its explanatory power. So when we are talking about events that can't be repeated, then we have to be careful drawing firm and hard conclusions about those things which can't be repeated. And what events can't be repeated? Well, when science talks about origins, it starts to become speculative simply because we can't repeat uh, those things. And therefore, a very important conclusion follows. Science does not and cannot disprove the claims of Christianity. Let's have a wrong view of faith and let's have a right view of faith. Remember the third question? Your Christianity is based on faith, but my science is based on fact. That's sometimes said. Let's think about that, shall we? Um, one of our most famous uh, atheists, uh, Richard Dawkins, says this. Faith is the great cop-out, the great excuse to evade the need to think and evaluate evidence. Faith is belief in spite of, or even be perhaps because of, the lack of evidence. Now that's a wrong view of faith. I'd like to explain why, if I can. Let me give you, first of all, a right view of faith. Now, has anyone been on EasyJet recently? <laughs> okay. Now you do need faith when you go on EasyJet. <laughs> it's not just because you're not sure when it's going to take off and land, but actually you have faith in a pilot 
that you have never seen before, that he is fully qualified and equipped to take off the airplane and to land it again. You've made a judgment unconsciously based on reasonable evidence that EasyJet are going to be able to get you there. And of course, you put your trust in a reliable person. The pilot, you never met him, probably. You never seen him, you hear a voice over the, over the airwaves when you sit down, but you're placing your faith in that man. So to say that faith is belief in spite of the evidence is in fact a wrong view of faith. But I'll come back to this uh, later on. The point I'd like to make tonight, ladies and gentlemen, is this. Christianity is evidence-based. It's a reasonable faith. It's not faith in spite of the evidence. It's faith because of the evidence, the overwhelming evidence for the truth of the, of the Christian faith. So let me just bring some of that evidence to you if I can. First of all, the evidence of our eyes and our ears. We look around and we ask the question, where did it all come from? We look at the stars, we look at the sea, we look at the tiny creatures, we look through the microscope, we look through the telescope, we ask ourselves the question, where did it all come from? And of course, not just where is it all from, but it works so well. Everything works. I remember teaching year one, uh, uh, electromagnetics, which is my uh, particular subject at, at the University of Liverpool, and I remember being impressed by teaching them uh, the inverse square law for charges together, they attract like charges repel and unlike charges uh, attract. And of course, the square term in that equation is accurate perfectly. It's not 2.000001, it's not 1.9999999, it's two. And that's the same for gravity, and that's the same for other inverse square uh, laws. The fine tuning of nature. And then if those two questions weren't difficult enough, life itself, the greatest miracle, the fact that we're all alive, how life forms in, in the, uh, the womb and the babies grow. And the only three bones that never change, of course, in your ear, the same when you were a baby, the same when you die. Everything else grows, but those three bones in your ear stay the same. Accident? Design. One of the subjects I teach at Liverpool is design. <laughs> How hard it is for design to work. How often the things I've designed never work as they should. And the students I work with, I tell them, what are you going to do when it goes wrong? And they say, well, it's not going to go wrong. I say, it is going to go wrong. <laughs> Every design goes wrong. You only need one mistake and it's wrong. And I teach them to, de to think of a strategy for correcting the design when the inevitable happens that they've forgotten something or left something or got something wrong. And of course, that's what universities are all about, to try and teach students to think about these things. But you know, the design of the universe fits together in such a wonderful way. How can you have design without a designer? How can you have a building without a builder? How can you have a tune without a composer? How can you have a painting without a painter? You can't. The Bible puts it like this. The invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead. The universe, finite and with a beginning, but started, created, conceived by one who is infinite and without a beginning and not part of his creation. The eternity of God seen in the creation of the universe in which we lived. Christianity is based on evidence. Now you're walking along a beach and suddenly you see a sandcastle. Three ladies, oriental in nature and costume. And you think to yourself, isn't it wonderful how the wind and the waves have blown all that sand together to form this model in front of me. You don't think that, do you? And you know, even though you might never have seen the sculptor, that this must be the product of a sand sculpture. You know that, don't you? 
No one disagrees with me here. Well, let me ask you this. If this is the product of design, how could the real thing, the women and the clothes, be the product of an accident? It couldn't be, could it? And yet, why do we therefore exclude in our schools the possibility of intelligent design in our science classrooms, as the government have done? It's not right. It's not scientific. <coughs> Christianity is evidence-based. We then come on to the evidence of the Bible. Christianity is based upon the Bible. It claims to be the word of the creator, the word of God. It's unlike every, any other book. It's the most translated. It's the most um, loved. And in some ways, you could say it's the most hated book in the world. And yet, it goes on. It claims to be the word of God more than 3,600 times. The word of the creator who's put words on a page, a book written by 40 different authors over 1,500 years, yet with one great theme, claiming to communicate his mind to us through the printed page. It can be translated. It has been translated more than any other book, and its message is all about the God of creation. Its teachings are unsurpassed wherever the Bible has been publicised and preached. Of course, it's lifted societies, and that's a well-documented fact. It has never been proven wrong. It has been assailed many times, but when the evidence has all come in, the Bible is, in fact, found to be correct. Let me give you an example of that. Um, in 1850, there was a, an archaeologist who claimed that... Um, Belshazzar, mentioned in the Bible, was fictitious. He didn't exist. He wasn't around. It was just a mistake by the biblical author. Only three years after, them, after that, the Nabonidus cylinder was found in the sands of Iraq naming Belshazzar. In other words, extra-biblical material confirmed what the Bible had said all along and denied or proved wrong what the critics had said. The one example I'd like to put before you tonight is one that you can easily assimilate now and you can check out when you get home. Predictive prophecy. The Bible contains hundreds of detailed and long-range prophecies which have been proven to be true. In other words, things which are mentioned in one part of the Bible which are then fulfilled hundreds, in some cases thousands, of years later. Let me give you one. Psalm 22 is in the middle of your Bible, just before Psalm 23, the famous psalm about the Lord's my shepherd. It speaks about, well, it speaks like this. They pierced my hands and my feet. They look and stare at me. They divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. That never happened to the author, but it happened to his son, as it were, after many generations. It <coughs> happened to the son of David called Jesus Christ upon the cross. His hands and his feet were pierced. He was a public spectacle by the side of a road, publicly executed, and hundreds passed by. His clothes were taken from him, and he was spat at and the subject of mockery and derision. It was all fulfilled. It was all foretold in Psalm 22, and when we read the accounts of the gospel writers, eyewitness accounts, a thousand years later, we find the fulfillment. Now, the other point to note about this is it talks about the piercing of the hands and the feet. That was written 300 years before the Phoenicians introduced crucifixion, about 700 BC. In other words, the Bible in 1000 BC predicts the mode of death of the Messiah 300 years before people would be put to death in that way. It's not just a one-off, but of course there are hundreds of prophecies like this. And again, for a sceptic amongst us, I, I would challenge you really to look at what the Bible says. Predictive prophecy, long-range, specific, fulfilled in detail, is an evidence that Christianity is true. Christianity, then, is evidence-based. We come to the evidence of Christ himself. 
the central figure of human history. Let me prove that to you. You've all got some coins in your pocket. What's the date on those coins? 2003, 2004, 1994, 1981, after who? Of course, the very coins in your pocket prove to you that there is uh, a person who divided history into AD and into BC. Today's date is proof that Jesus Christ existed. Eyewitness accounts, not one, not two, not three, but four eyewitness accounts are in the Bible. Jesus claimed to be God. I and my Father are one, he said. He rose from the dead three days after the crucifixion. Christianity is evidence-based. Dr. Luke says this, after his suffering he showed himself alive by many infallible proofs being seen of them 40 days. And of course the facts of the case are these. Christ lived. Christ died upon that cross and three days later his tomb was empty. There is a first century tomb, not the one that Jesus was put in, but very similar to that one. And of course, he not only predicted his resurrection, the Old Testament predicted his resurrection and it came true. He was seen alive by hundreds of witnesses. Some of them were his friends. Some of them were doubters. They didn't believe at first. And some of them were enemies. The Apostle Paul was an enemy who was converted by vision of the risen Christ. This is very important, ladies and gentlemen. He was seen on 11 occasions by more than 520 witnesses over a period of 40 days. Mary Magdalene, James and Joanna, female witnesses, male witnesses, Cleopas and his companion on the road to Emmaus. The apostles all saw him. Thomas the doubter didn't believe. Jesus appeared and he did believe. And the apostle Paul. Direct evidence of the empty tomb. As the angel said, he's not here. He is risen. Come and see the place where he lay. Do you know, some of the greatest legal minds have looked at the evidence for the resurrection and have concluded it is completely solid. Lord Chief Justice Darling said, there exists such overwhelming evidence, positive and negative, factual and circumstantial. No intelligent jury in the world could fail to bring in a verdict that the resurrection story is true. And of course, Frank Morrison, the skeptic lawyer, rationalistic, didn't believe, went to the Holy Land to investigate for himself firsthand the evidence for the resurrection. The book that refused to be written, he went as a skeptic, but when he looked at the evidence, he came to the conclusion uh, the stone was moved. And Jesus was resurrected, just as he said he would be. Great book to read. Christianity, ladies and gentlemen, is evidence-based. And then the evidence, powerful evidence, that exists today in the present. Peter the denier, Thomas the doubter, Paul the persecutor, Mary Magdalene, and Lydia the merchant were all converted then. But throughout history, Augustine, the immoral, Elizabeth Fry, religious but not right with God, converted and then went on to reform our prisons. And we all know John Newton, one time harbour master of the port of Liverpool, of course, sailing a slave ship, but converted and went about to ab abolish the slave trade that he had uh, prospered from for so long. And of course, it's still happening today. Many in this audience could say, yes, I've met with the risen Christ and he's made a big difference a tremendous difference to my life. You may say, well, where is the conflict? The conflict is with this philosophy called atheistic naturalism. Simply put, it's like this. There is no creator. There is no design. There is no purpose. Everything there is has emerged and evolved by chance from an unknown void. That's a citation, by the way, not my definition. You could put it like this. Nothing plus no one equals everything. That is the equation of the atheistic naturalist. Of course, it is unproven. It's a philosophy. It's not supported 
by scientific ex experience or experiment. And it differs in that case from experimental science. Christianity and naturalism, they are not friends. They are opposed. But I put it to you that science and atheistic naturalism are also opposed. My questions to the atheist, where did it all come from? How did a fine-tuned universe come out of chaos by chance? How did life arise spontaneously from dead matter? Where did my conscience come from? And of course, how do you explain the life, the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, not to mention the book that calls itself the Word of God? It was the risen Christ who said these words, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. The risen Christ can be known in our experience. He can be known by personal faith in him. I'm one of those who's come to that conclusion and I commend it to you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you.